make a, a sort of, what, what, what is, I have to confess, a kind of rehearsal for another talk, actually. Um, I was invited a few months ago um, by a former student of mine who's now a professor in Os Oslo, uh, Tris von Michel, and he asked me to come and contribute to a, a workshop he's doing with his students about the idea of kind of re-presentation in, um, in art practice. And so, um, a little bit uh, inspired by um, what happened uh, earlier this year in Ostend, um, the re part of the reason I'm here is because Godard um, invited me to take part in um, his, uh, a, a film festival that he curates in, in Ostend, you probably know about, um, and he asked to show a work of mine called Autozylopyrocycloboros, which is, I'm actually going to talk about that work later, but, um, and he found this very beautiful context to show that work, um, which in some ways kind of, I don't know, reinvented and reinvigorated that work for me again. It's a, a piece that I made 15 years ago. Um, and um, it got me kind of thinking about this idea of um, the representation of work. And um, so I thought I would sort of address that idea. And it's also a little bit, all of my talks um, are somehow about what it means to make a talk as well. And which again is about the notion of representation, if you like. Um, and it's also a little bit about the relationship between photography and film and um, sort of sculpture, I guess, um, and process. Um, so it, it's kind of trying to, it's probably trying to deal with way too much um, and will probably go on far too long, but um, just see how, I know you've got rather sort of uncomfortable seats to sit in, but um, we'll see how it goes. And I can always kind of, you know, that's the trouble with doing a new talk every time I do a talk. I, I'm never quite sure how long they're going to last. So um, you'll have to bear with me. But I'm going to start with um, a, a work called A Talk, which w is a kind of condensation of a number of different talks that I made in a, in a bunch of different cities over a period of a few years, um, which I kind of um, turned into a, a, a film work in a way. Um, it's a kind of documentation of, a, or I should say, a dramatization of a, um, a, a talk of mine. So I'm, I'm going to start with the first sort of four minutes of that, and we'll see how we uh, see how we go. Hang on a second. I hope the sound is doing what the sound should do. Firstly, uh, thank you for coming. Oh, um, so much. I was once told about a philosophy professor based in Germany, his name now escapes me, um, who will only accept an invitation to make a lecture if he can walk to the venue. Now, while somehow extraordinarily heroic, the, uh, the epic dramaturgy of a two or three week long walk ahead of a lecture strikes me as establishing dangerously high expectations. It's, it's got to be pretty great when you finally arrive. Uh, to temper any such expectations, I can inform you that today I walked here from the train station in town, a distance of a few kilometres. Um, I've made a point over the years of trying to do a new talk every time I'm invited, and I'll, and I'll tell you why later. Uh, something that addresses a particular context, location or exhibition. Uh, today I'm going to try to think out loud about notions of translation, transmutation, and transposition. Uh, inevitably, making a talk for the first time means they are often a little sketchy and sometimes even somewhat symbolic. So uh, you'll have to bear with me as, uh, as this thing unfolds. First, I thought it might be interesting uh, to talk about the roles of talks uh, within my practice as a whole. Uh, they've become important to me, both as a way of representing works that are often site-specific in nature, and as a means of uh, fleshing out works that have emerged out of webs of historical, geographical and political connections, uh, works which have what's often referred to by the media as complex backstories. The image here 
is of me, uh, the artist Simon Starling, uh, being played by the Scottish actor Stephen Clyde, who is the one in the grey, uh, during a performance of the play At Twilight, a play for two actors, three musicians, one dancer, eight masks and a donkey costume. Um, a piece of theatre that was performed outdoors last August at Glasgow's Homewood House. The, uh, the two actors, Stephen and uh, Adam Clifford, uh, played a number of different roles, uh, adopting different masks and costumes throughout. The events on stage were mediated by myself, played by Stephen, and my uh, collaborator on At Twilight, the theatre maker Graham Etoff, uh, played by Adam. Now, while Graham slash Adam constantly cajoled me slash Stephen uh, to get on with the business of making the play, my character, as in real life, it seems, uh, constantly returned to the relative safety of the makeshift lectern to frame proceedings, uh, to tell the, the backstories to the making of this play within a play within a play. Um, a play, in fact, about mistranslation and somewhat ham-fisted cross-cultural appropriation. But... More on that later. Um, one of the reasons I've always tried to make a new talk every time is that when I was living in Glasgow, I, I moved there in 1990, um, the artist Lawrence Vina, uh, renowned for uh, translating sculpture into language or language into sculpture, I'm, I'm not really sure which, uh, he came to town to make an exhibition. And to accompany that, he also gave an incredible talk. It was one of those... Um, life-changing moments where somebody turns up who seems able to connect uh, so many things that are buzzing around in your young brain. It was, it was just the right lecture to hear at that moment, no doubt. Um, then he came back a few years later and he gave exactly the same seemingly improvised lecture again. And I was kind of devastated. And I vowed from then on that I would never repeat the same talk twice. I mean, it was a great lecture and there's no shame in doing that. It was just because it was so important to me the first time I heard it, almost as if he was making it just for me in the moment. That was so devastating the second time round. Beyond the pale, perhaps. Um, so, um, yeah, that was that was a little bit of it's a hour long uh, video work, um, as I say, a kind of dramatization of a, a, a talk or a number of talks that, um, and of course, the voice, as you will have guessed, was Stephen, the actor who played me in the play, um, and it, it, it's a partly a joke about the fact that I I started my career in Glasgow, and whenever people meet, they, meet me for the first time, they're like, oh, but I thought you were Scottish. And of course, you know, so I got a Scottish actor to play me in, in, the, in the work. So um, what I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna sort of, uh, I guess uh, what I wanted to talk about was this idea of, um, for me, the works exist as, as kind of constellations of actions and processes and images and objects and texts and publications and artist talks like this one and anecdotes told in the pub and so on and so on. Um, and many, many, works, many works that I've made um, have, have kind of taken several forms, in fact. And I, 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 I like the idea that there's no hierarchy in those um, in, in, in those different forms, that the, there, there are different ways of, of manifesting a, a work in the world. And um, um, one very good example of that is, is a, a work that I made in 2002, which was my first gallery show with a, a, a Turin-based gallery called Galleria Franco Nuero. Um, it's called Flagger. 1972 to 2000, and um, it's a work that um, has three or four forms in a way um, as, as a piece of work. It, it began life as a journey from in a small red Fiat manufactured in Turin 
um, and um, driven to Poland, and then in a, in a garage in Poland, all of the movable body parts were swapped out for Polish manufactured body parts that were white. And then I drove back to Turin again, and the car was stuck on the wall like a painting um, in this tiny sort of um, former shop on uh, Via Mancini in, in, um, in Turin. Um, so it's, it, it's a work that sort of emerged out of a sort of interest in, in, in the sort of manufacturing and design history of, of, of the city of Turin. And it talks about this moment when the Italians started to realize that they could manufacture cars much cheaper in Poland under the communist regime than they could in their own, in their own um, country. And so they sort of, it's an early example of kind of outsourcing of, of, of labor, if you like, um, and of globalization. Um, and um, the, the, um, the, uh, the car kind of originally sat um, in the gallery, kind of in beautiful proximity to all the cars that were driving past looking for parking spaces in the, in the street outside. And um, we could only just get it through the door um, and onto the wall. Um, and of course, you know, the, the work has been shown in a number of different exhibitions subsequently to that. Um, this is it in the Macval Museum in, in Paris. Um, and um, here it is in the MCA in, in Chicago. And every time the work gets shown again, it seems to develop these new kind of, it, sort of new kind of intersections between um, different geographies, if you like, different sort of um, um, networks of, um, of, of connection, which, which are partly due to the, the local context, but also very often to do with the other, other works that are exhibited uh, alongside it in these kind of survey uh, shows that I've been able to make in the last 10, 15 years. So um, it, it, in that sense, it's a kind of mutable thing, the work. It, 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 it responds to its, um, its surroundings in, in some sense. Um, the work also exists as a, a series of um, five photographic images um, and um, this is the, the car on its way back from Poland in um, uh, the Czech Republic um, and then in Posdorf in Austria, uh, Villach in Austria. This is actually, those are the Alps in the background. This is Padua on its way back to Turin. Um, and then finally, from the second floor of the gallery space, um, as it arrived in, in, uh, in Turin to be installed on the wall. Um, and then perhaps, for me most importantly, this, um, one of the things I've done systematically actually with Franco particularly is to, every time I make a, a show with him, we make a publication. It just became a kind of thing with our working relationship. And this was the first book we made together. Um, and it's a, a small, very modest little uh, catalog based, of course, as you can see, on the original design for the, the, the Fiat car manual, um, which we just appropriated and very carefully sort of reworked into a, a sort of, yeah, it's, it's partly a, a, a kind of catalog, it's partly a travelogue, it's partly, um, you know, also still a, um, a, a manual for the car, actually, with all the specifications of the, um, and I suppose also partly an artist book work, you could say. It's just... Uh, the piece de resistance was the, the fold-out page with the uh, gallery plan. Uh, as you can see, the car was um, large in the tiny little gallery space. 
Um, that was the engine that we actually had to take out before we hung the car on the wall. Um, and again, the specifications for the, the car were, were left in the back with some installation views. Um, and then lastly, in relation to Flagger, I just found, I was leafing through some documentation that I had on my archive, and I found this little film that the MacVal in, um, on the Mac, sorry, in, um, in Montreal made when they installed the work in the museum there. And it, it's a very good example of how the work kind of becomes, in a way, an, an, an anecdote as much as anything, a, a story to be told and retold. Um, and so I just thought I'd put, it's, it's a, um, uh, the, the museum director um, just talking very briefly about en production dans les années 70 en Italie. L'aspect de transformation dans cette œuvre est que l'artiste prend cette voiture italienne produite à Turin et la conduit jusqu'en Pologne à l'usine délocalisée de la production de cette voiture. Il change quelques pièces qui suggèrent le drapeau polonais et la reconduit finalement en Italie pour l'exposer. Presque chaque œuvre dans l'exposition a subi un processus de transformation économique et sociale et politique, et parfois même personnelle. Different in a way. Um, one of the things I've one of the things I've always been sort of struggling with, um, and one of the reasons that I, you know, really value the making of publications and the writing of texts and the giving of lectures, and also subsequently the sort of making of more elaborate kind of narrative films. Um, was this, I, I was always struggling with how, how to bring all of the sort of the research, the, what I talk about in the talk as being the backstories of, of the making of works, the process, um, interplay in, the, in the, the final work. And um, I guess the next piece that I'm going to talk about, which is called Wilhelm Noack OHG, which is just the name of a company of metal fabricators in, in Berlin, which I made in 2005 um, when I was living in Berlin. And I was kind of, I really wanted to find a, a, a kind of reason to make a work about Berlin somehow. And I, I was making another piece for an exhibition um, in, in um, Barcelona. And Part of that work involved making a replica of a glass screen that was designed by the German designer Lili Reich, who was working with Mies van der Rohe and others in the um, 20s and 30s in, in, in Berlin. And a friend of mine recommended this company, Wilhelm Nowak, and said they might know how to make the metalwork to hold those pieces of glass up. And I went to the Bauhaus archive and I found the original plans for that and I copied those and I took them to Mr. Nowak and his son. And the two of them sort of started laughing when I pulled out these plans. And it turned out that Mr. Nowak's father had made the originals for Lili Reich back in the day. And um, so this kind of, I don't know, it triggered this idea of trying to make a work with and about 
uh, the Noaks and their kind of history within the city. Um, and um, it's a company that's been going for over a hundred years. They actually closed subsequently, which is a shame, but um, it, was, it had a long history. They worked with all sorts of different um, architects and um, on many, many different um, projects. And um, one, of the, um, <coughs> one of the things that was very important was I finally, I, I sort of, I asked old Mr. Nowak, you know, do you, have a, do you have an archive or somewhere where you keep, um, you know, the history of, of this company? Um, and he was like, he would sort of pull a drawer from his desk and pull out an old photograph of his father or something like that. And, but finally he pulled, opened another drawer and he took this big rusty key and he took me into the Hinterhof of the, of the building in, in Neukölln and up the stairs and opened this door. And there was a small room, completely chaotic, packed full of folders and files and tubes and, and that was the archive of the Noak company. And that became the, the sort of, yeah, the seedbed of the, the project that I made. Um, and um, I started to think about how to, to sort of document the workshops and, and think about what, what made sense. And, and first of all, I took a little video camera, plastic sort of small video camera, and started to work with it. And, and I soon realized that this small light video camera made absolutely no sense in this sort of um, tough environment and that I needed a, a big solid 35 millimeter camera. So that became the kind of the device for making the work. Um, and suddenly we decided to make a film only using equipment that was available in, in the workshop. So not using, you know, dollies and, and uh, you know, fancy equipment from the camera rental, but just what was there. So this is, for example, the, the camera hung in a kind of sling that we could then pull up and make this sort of strange panning shot of the wall of the, um, and we used the, the drill, the old drill from the thing and spun the uh, camera on that to make another kind of uh, panning shot of the, the space and so on. Um, and so, um, Again, yeah, a little trolley for moving heavy things around was kind of kicked around with a camera on it. And then I, I started to think about how I could kind of co-opt um, the, the NOAX into <coughs> helping me produce a system for showing the film, a kind of loop machine that would um, was something that they would be able to build in the workshops and could be part of the, the film. Um, and we developed, a, it, it's an idea that comes from a spiral staircase actually, a, a design by, by Carlo Molino, a, a Turin-based um, architect and designer. And, and um, it, 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 it struck me as being a really kind of nice way to get the film from the, basically from the bottom of the camera back up to the top again on these 84 arms that would um, surround this column, this stainless steel column that went from the ground. Can you see any of these images? Yeah. It's okay, okay. It looks really weird from down here. Um, and um, so this is what we, um, this is what we, we did. We, we, we made this, um, this kind of really, actually really well-functioning loop machine. Um, and um, and edited down uh, four minutes of, of footage on 35 millimeter, um, which ran through the the um, the loop machine, and it, it was a way for me. I, I I sort of began life as a as a photographer making still images, and for me making films is, is sort of about negotiating this relationship between moving images and still images. And what you're doing with this machine is you're basically putting the, the kind of, the individual still images on display. Um, they're, they're illuminated by the moving image which is falling on the wall behind them as they run through the, the projector. 
it's almost as if if you, if you put your eye close to one thing, you could see it animated by the, the flickering image behind. Um, so, and then of course, um, one of the great moments of this was um, finally opening the exhibition and the whole Nowak family turning up very modestly and kind of slightly shy, standing at the back of the gallery and watching this machine that they'd been involved in making, showing this film about, you know, essentially about kind of a hundred and something years of their, their family's um, working lives. And so I'm just going to show you that. It's a, it's, a, it's a very short film, so we'll just, we'll just watch it. And um, I don't know how the sound will be on this one, but let's see. Um. <laughs> So, 
Yeah, so that, that was a kind of moment where somehow it, it, it actually took, it, it took me a while uh, to sort of, I don't know, make a, make a next move after making that work. Because it did have this incredible, it was, it was the most kind of, kind of contained sort of hermetic thing that I'd ever managed to produce. And um, I, yeah, I, I didn't know, I, I realized I, I didn't want to do that again, but um, I also, yeah, didn't know quite how to um, sort of proceed, I suppose. So, um, the next, actually this, this, we're now coming back to the work that um, I was uh, showing in Ostend, in, in Godat's uh, film festival, Autozylo Pyrocycloboros. And um, I w I'm, I'm just gonna talk about a, a moment where that, that work has again found a kind of, uh, an, an interesting new life in a, in a kind of re-presentation as it were. Um, and this image is of the Pier Art Centre, which is a tiny museum in Orkney in the north of Scotland on the Orkney Islands and in Stromness. And it's an amazing place. It has an incredible collection of um, uh, modern and contemporary art. And um, it's linked to one particular collector who had a huge interest in what was happening at the other end of Britain in um, St. Ives in Cornwall, where was the, there was this flourishing um, kind of scene, art scene, um, in sort of mid-century um, Britain. And um, she acquired a lot of works from uh, Cornwall and brought them to Scotland and housed them in this little um, brick, brick building on the stone building on the pier in, in, uh, in Stromness. And um, I, I, I took part in the Venice Biennale um, as one of the representatives of Scotland. Um, and after that show, they wanted to bring that exhibition back to Scotland and kind of tour it, as it were. And I'd, I'd made this giant kind of floating island for rhododendron plants called Island for Weeds, which was quite impossible to, to take to Stromness. So we decided to show this other work <coughs> Autozylo Pyrocycloboros, which um, I'd made in Scotland, in Loch Long. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But, um, and um, so we installed that work, oh God, you can't see that very well, um, in, in a small, very low ceilinged, a little bit like the boat, actually, <laughs> that, that uh, Goddard put their work on, um, the barge. And um, it's, a, it's a, a work of 38, um, medium format slides which are projected from this rather lovely old um, Gertzmann medium format projector and um, uh, it's actually it, it's again it's it's a it's a representation of a kind of action that happened on Loch Long um, it's a sort of I described it as a sort of entropic voyage I suppose it's, it's simply put, it's a, the story of a boat that kind of eats itself. Um, so we, we took a, an old wooden um, boat and installed a steam engine on it and then basically made this kind of four hour long trip around Loch Long, which is the area where the Scottish nuclear deterrent is kept. There's the fast lane naval base there, um, and there's a, a mountain just up the loch where they store the nuclear missiles when they're not on the submarines. It's kind of, yeah, all a bit kind of James Bond, if you like. And um, th there's, a, there's an amazing tradition of kind of uh, protest and um, actions that are made uh, constantly to sort of try and keep the, the presence of the nuclear arsenal in the, in the press. And um, 
I guess my, my project came out a little bit out of um, thinking about that um, uh, tradition somehow. And of course, the Clyde estuary is also the, the birthplace of the steamship and um, so there, there's a sort of, there's a, there's a context there for, for working in this way. And um, I'm just showing you a, a handful of the 38 images from a sequence um, which were made um, along this, along the trip. Um, this is already getting quite close to the, the end. Um, the title, Autoxylopyrocycloboros, is a kind of, um, it's a sort of uh, collage of a lot of ancient Greek uh, building blocks um, that refers to a sort of, it's, it refers to the Ouroboros, which was the sort of alchemical symbol of eternal life, the, the, the snake that's eating its own tail, um, but also refers to a, a self kind of burning, uh, pyro, wood burning kind of machine, as it were. Um, and you know, there's, uh, it, it, it has, it has a relationship to kind of, I don't know, Tom and Jerry, perhaps cartoons and, and slapstick, um, comedy, um, and, uh, maybe a little bit to Gordon Matta Clark. I don't know, some, somehow and architecture, etc. Um, and of course ended like that, um, and um, I was, um, I can't remember actually what year it was, but um, it, it, I think it was around 2007, I, I was invited to make an exhibition in, um, in St. Ives at the, um, the Tate St. Ives, which is a kind of outreach project for the Tate in London. Um, and it's a, it's a, kind of very particular, slightly ugly um, 1980s building that overlooks this incredible beach in St. Ives where there's always the surfers there surfing the, the good waves that come in from the Atlantic. And um, because of its kind of connection to, to the Orkney Gallery, I decided to sort of restage the, the Orkney exhibition in... Um, in St. Ives, and sort of came up with this idea to build a kind of replica of the St. Ives, the Pier Art Center, um, on its own kind of little jetty, its own little pier of scaffold. And the windows that normally look onto the sea in Scotland also looked onto the sea, but down south in England. It's a bit like kind of taking a map of Britain and folding it in half, and then you've got kind of the Orkney Islands collapsed onto um, to Cornwall, to, to St. Ives. Um, and inside, you could, as you can see, you can see the ocean outside and the beach, the white sand beach outside. No, I can't, no surfers out there, but... Um, and then through, in the back, the dark space was the, the reenactment of the projection of the work in... Um, we also installed a work from the collection, and they lent us a, a small painting by Alfred Wallace, um, who was one of the early kind of pioneers of the, the St. Ives scene, a kind of naive painter who made this rather beautiful little painting of a steamship on an old piece of cardboard, um, which is called St. Ives Harbor and, the, and Good Reavy from 1934 to 38. Um, so that was kind of installed in relation to the, the this, and here is the the room again, um, in every minute detail. I have to say it was a really kind of quite convincing um, for the for the curators who came down from from the Pier Art Center. It was a slightly uncanny experience, I think. So that was a yeah, just a, a kind of example of how. Um, a work can sort of take on a new life in a new in a new context, I suppose. Um, the next the next example of that um, I'm going to talk about is is when when sort of two works that were made for very specific sites um, 
come together and, and, and something, again, something new happens in, in the, the sort of dialogue between those two works. Um, and um, I just, I just, I, I thought I'd just read, I wrote this little, it was part, part of a, a longer um, text, but um, I just wrote this thing about uh, this kind of notion of sight, um, which I, I, I is something that's kind of um, there or thereabouts in, in most of the works that I make. Um, and so I'll just read that quickly. Um, the small, the small numbers of number of works presented here are part of a much larger body of such works, which are fueled by the specifics of place or sight. They are not works that are bound physically to those sites. They are, not, they are therefore not site-specific in the traditional sense, but are rather free-roaming, autonomous works that exist as a result of action or process made at or in light of the particular sites in question. These places or sites, while occasionally chosen for me through invitations or commissions, become home to half-formed ideas and or narrative structures. They inhabit these ideas, flesh out these narrative structures, and their specific geographies, histories, and ecologies. As places, they are invariably complex amalgams of political, social, historical, and ecological notions, places which are hard to unpick, it, it, sorry, places where it is hard to unpick the interwoven realms of culture and nature, become, and culture and nature become inseparable. In fact, perhaps nature is an unproductive term here. They are often, temporally complex too, anachronistic, in that they seem both mired in the past and prophetic or even futuristic. As such, they, are often, see, they often seem to prompt anachronistic responses, responses that push and pull at contemporary notions of time, slowing things down, redeploying redundant technologies, <coughs> excuse me, or pre-existing artworks, or simply conflating the past and the present. So that's just a little kind of idea about how I approach the idea of the site and, and um, <coughs> in my work. And this is a this is a cactus, um, uh, which is on um, the film sets. You can just see the backs of some of the film sets um, <coughs> that were built for Sergio, Sergio Leone in the desert, in the Tabernas Desert in Spain. He, he filmed um, in the 60s, 70s, he filmed a lot of spaghetti westerns in the, Sp the Spanish desert. And um, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, A Fistful of Dollars, those kinds of films. And as a result of that, there was a lot of kind of, uh, there's been a lot of sort of planting of different um, cactuses uh, as sort of props for, of course, cactuses are not, indigenous to, to Europe. So any cactus that you see has kind of come um, from South America mostly, um, Central and South America. And um, so I, I made a, a project, I, I, I got the, the, f the company that run the film sets, which is called Texas Hollywood. And um, they agreed to let me dig up one of their cactuses and transport it in my um, red uh, Volvo estate car to to Frankfurt to the Porticus Gallery, which is um, connected to the Städelschule where I used to teach, um, and um, I made a project there called Cactane House, which was a, uh, a essentially a, a kind of an improvised heating system to create a, a desert-like atmosphere for the cactus in the winter in Frankfurt using the engine from the Volvo. And basically you turned, you sat in the car in the morning, turned on the, the turned the ignition and the engine came on in the exhibition space. The water was pumped around by the pump and circulated and, and created this kind of beautiful radiator um, all around the space, and the same with the exhaust fumes, which heated the exhaust, the 30 meter long exhaust pipe. Um, and um, the next, the, the, that, that work, um, I think that was made, I think that was in 2002 or something, I made that work, 
prior to, to getting a job actually at the art school there. And um, this work is, is kind of the antithesis of that in a way. It was, it's a, it's a work called Plant Room um, and it was made for uh, a completely unregulated old industrial building, the Kunstraum Dornbjörn. And when I went to uh, meet the curator and the director of the space, they basically said, you know, you can do what the hell you like in here. The only thing we can't do is show archival material because we, ha we, you know, we can't control the climate in this space. You know, it's too cold in the winter, it's too warm in the summer. <coughs> and, and of course, for me, that was like an invitation. And um, so I, I developed this project with the help of an architect who's working with um, old uh, technologies to do with mud, mud bricks, adobe kind of um, building techniques and uh, a, a kind of fairly simple um, and very low energy um, co cooling he heating system that kind of ran water through the, the walls of this adobe structure. And um, it's, um, it, 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 it's a, a, a form, uh, an architectural form designed just by hanging a chain upside down and tracing the shape and then turning that upside down to create this very strong kind of but simple um, you know material brick uh, brick form and inside plant room were some rather valuable um, Karl Blossfeld original prints from the UDK collection in Berlin um, and the, the mud brick technology coupled with this, this sort of um, fuel cell driven cooling heating system allowed us to create a you know, museum quality um, atmosphere for these photographs to be shown. Um, now, a, few, a couple of years after I made that work, they, they, I got this invitation to make a work in the in this space, which is the temporary Kunsthal in, um, in Berlin, which doesn't exist anymore. It was there for a few years. They've now put a whopping great ugly reconstruction of a old building there as a museum. Um, it was on uh, uh, Unter den Linden in, in, in Berlin. And it was a very sort of, a, a kind of a little bit like Porticus in a way in Frankfurt. It was a, a kind of prefab um, plywood box basically and again a fairly unregulated um, climate um, and it seemed like the perfect place to bring together these two works Cactain House um, and, um, and Plant Room and to sort of it was like a kind of face off between these two systems that were both in a way competing against each other Cactain House trying to warm up the space um, plant room kind of trying to control the climate to allow these photographs to be um, so it was a kind of you know a kind of reinvention in a way of the two of the two works um, and uh, yeah it was it was a, a, a sort of exciting uh, uh, representation of both those both those projects Pooh. Um, are you are you all surviving? I'm I'm I've got a little way to go yet, but um, are, are we good? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk uh, now about a kind of another aspect of the notion of of representation, um, which is related to a, an interest that I have in. Um, uh, installation photographs um, and part of the reason for this is that I, 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 studied, I studied photography originally as I think I said and then I went to fine art school and did an MA in fine art but I had this kind of I had this sort of craft in a way that I'd learnt at photography school and so I, I, I started making 
installation views for museums and galleries and artists in Scotland where I was living in Glasgow. And um, that was my kind of living, a way of you know, paying the rent and stuff for, for many years after graduating. And I, I think I learned a lot about how to make exhibitions um, through having to concentrate on making images of exhibitions. And so there's always, I've always had this kind of particular interest in you know, the history of the development of the idea of the it kind of the installation view, um, which is a, in some sense a fairly recent uh, phenomena, or it's only really recently being used um, uh, in a in a in a it, it, it's yeah it's it's quite rare to find installation views of exhibitions you know even before the 1960s 70s actually because before you photographed art objects and um, it wasn't about the relationship between one art object and the other um, and uh, these photographs that I'm going to show you are very lovely installation views made by um, the German photographer Albert Renger Patch, who worked for the Folkwand Museum in Essen as their kind of in-house photographer. And um, he, he was basically given use of darkrooms and studios and et cetera in, in return for making photographs for them. And, and they're very, they're very beautiful, very, of course, Renga patch like very controlled and, and sort of analytical and um, elegant images of artworks and installations of artworks in the museum. The museum has this very interesting kind of mix of um, kind of contemporary art or what was contemporary art then, um, kind of avant-garde painting and these kind of ethnographic objects, these collections of um, objects from around the world. And they, they constantly were mixing the two, um, the, the two um, types of objects in a, in a quite interesting way. And I found, I was basically invited by the Folkwang to make the last exhibition in a space, a museum, part of the museum that was about to be demolished to make way for this brand new, um, beautiful Chipperfield building that they have now. And um, it was, so it was, quite a nice, it was quite a nice moment. I mean, literally, as my, as my exhibition came down, the wrecking balls came in to destroy the museum. And um, I, I, I found in, in these archives at the, the Folkwang Museum, I found four photographs of this one space that was in an old, this building, this villa that was one of the buildings that made up the museum prior to the Second World War, was um, uh, destroyed. It was it was bombed. Essen was really flattened in the in the Second World War, um, and um, fortunately, all the artworks were, or a majority of the artworks were were safe, um, hidden away. But the, the building itself was destroyed, and, and um, the building that I was um, was working in was a you know a post-war building that had sort of taken their place in a way, and um, so there were these, these these sort of four different views of the same kind of constellation of objects that kind of um, grabbed my attention, and. Um, so I, I started this sort of process of basically remaking um, Wenger Patch's photographs. And what we did was we built um, a replica of the rooms where those photographs were made um, out of the, the sort of mobile wall system that they still used in the, in the galleries that were about to be destroyed. And um, sort of rehung the the works in that context um, we had to build replica vitrines and sort of radiator covers and also speculate about the color of 
the floor and the walls and so on and so on. Um, but we made a fairly sort of convincing um, uh, replica of what that space might have felt like. One of the things that became very interesting was um, what had happened to a lot of the works. You know, the, the, the Nazis had confiscated a number of works from the museum and they were now in Swiss collections or in America or, and some of those things we couldn't get back. But we, so we made some sort of replicas of them to hang in the place of the, so this, this kind of act of, of trying to remake the pictures kind of was a way to sort of unpack the history of that, um, that collection in, in a way. Um, these, these are the, yeah, the kind of color images. And, and the, 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 the public could come and see the, um, the reconstruction of, of the space as, as it is there in the photographs. And then outside that, that on the wall were my four <coughs> small black and white replicas of the, the Ringer Patch originals. Um, very simple. The work's called Nachbau, uh, which means kind of reconstruction, I suppose. Um, <coughs> I, I, I feel like I have to hurry up a little bit. Um, the, the, that, that kind of, that idea of working with, um, working with installation views and gallery plans and, and all of that um, kind of came back again when I was invited to Camden Art Center um, in North London to curate an exhibition. And the, the Camden Art Center have this tradition of, you know, every three or four years they invite an artist to come and curate a show. And um, I, I, was, I was rather nervous about the idea of, of kind of curating anything, I had to say. And so I sort of came up with a, a model for making a show which sort of avoided, in a way, curating to some degree. Um, and what I, what I proposed was an exhibition that became known as Never the Same River, Possible Futures, Probable Pasts. And basically what we did was I went, I went through the archives of Camden Art Center, which are in a library, a public library in North London. And um, I, looked, I was looking for works that sort of dealt with ideas of time in different ways. And, and then those works were put back into the building in exactly the same place that they were shown in the past. So using the installation views and the gallery plans, we, we just, we, we structured a show which was a kind of conflation of 40 years of exhibition programming um, in a single exhibition, a kind of cacophony, a temporal cacophony, if you like. And, um, you know, an example of that would be, you know, we found this image uh, in a catalog of, it was an exhibition called Hampstead in the 30s, and there was this display of Isocon, which is a, a famous building project in, in, in North London, in, in, in Hampstead. And so we, we tracked down all of the objects that are in that, um, in that um, display, and then and sort of remade it. You can see there, just behind, um, the tree there, um, the bronze tree. And, um, you know, so that was the kind of modus operandi, if you like, the, the, the layering of, of the history of the exhibition space. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, I'm talking about this rather sort of, this, this is the, one of the main gallery spaces. Actually, the, the most sort of important, you might say, and valuable work in the exhibition got, as a result of this system, got stuck behind another work. So the little orange top of a painting you can see there is a Francis Bacon um, work, um, which got layered behind a, a work by a young uh, British artist, Jeremy Miller, um, and so on. And then there's, you know, there's a little face-off between 
a modernist chair that was shown in that Hampstead show again, and an, an Egyptianate um, arts and crafts chair which kind of face each other, and so on and so on. So there were all these kind of illusions to, um, uh, to time and the passing of time. And one of the most, one of the most extraordinary experiences was this um, the remaking of Mike Nelson's uh, studio apparatus work which he made, he had made 10 years before when he was a young artist and he came back, he, most of the stuff for this had disappeared long ago or been reincorporated incorporated into other works. But he, he amazingly managed to sort of remake the whole thing. And it was a really strange experience for people who'd been there the first time it was shown and to come back and see it again exactly the same. Um, and uh, yeah. Mike said that he, he always had this idea that his 10-year younger self was just behind him, telling him what to do kind of thing as he worked. But, um, yeah. So that was, that was never, never the same river. Um, <coughs> and then just very briefly, um, before we see another little film snippet, um, pictures for an exhibition, again a work that started with two installation views of an exhibition at the Arts Club in... It was an exhibition that I made for the Arts Club in Chicago based on an exhibition that was at the Arts Club in 1927, a Brancusi exhibition that was installed in Brancusi's absence by Marcel Duchamp, who was kind of acting as Brancusi's dealer in America at that time. And most of the works came from John Quinn's collection, who had, he died recently very young. He was a great collector of modernism. He had 11 of Brancusi's sculptures in his collection. And, and so uh, Duchamp and a, a colleague of his, uh, Henri Pierre Rocher, the writer, they bought the works back from the estate and started to sort of sell them. And this exhibition was part of that process. And um, very, very briefly, I, I kind of, um, I got these two old Deodorf um, plate cameras, 8x10 cameras, um, which were made in Chicago. Um, and um, I transposed an outline drawing of the two installation views of this exhibition that exist. And um, I went around 12 or so different museums in Europe and America um, to find all of the works that had been in that exhibition which of course had been dispersed and sold and had many owners and some were in private hands and others uh, in public collections and so on and so a sort of process every time I found one of the works it was put back in exactly the same spot on the negative um, via this drawing and then and then photographed and so slowly we were able to build up these sort of composited layered um, sort of reenactments of the installation that Marcel Duchamp had, the sort of chess-like um, installation that Marcel Duchamp had um, orchestrated for Brancusi's work in Chicago. And it ends up as a series of 38 um, or 36 photographs. Um, and of course, uh, a book again. Um, and the book is a kind of provenance history of all of the sculptures and where they'd been and who'd owned them and some stories related to these different characters that had owned them. Um, it's quarter past nine. Are we, are we still in good shape for a little bit? Okay, okay, good. Um, uh, th this is, uh, this is um, El Echo. Um, there's, um, there's a very, very beautiful exhibition space in Mexico City um, called El Eco, and it was, um, it was founded by an, a German emigre architect and artist called um, Göritz, Matthias Göritz, um, in the 1950s. It opened in 1953, and um, it sort of, I don't know, it mutated and it became a bar or a nightclub at one stage and it fell into disrepair. And then more recently it was restored back to its original 
um, form, and it's a very beautiful um, kind of modernist building. Um, you'll see more of it in this brief part of a film that I'm going to show you. Um, and um, I, I, I was invited to make an exhibition there, and I'd, I'd made I'd made a, a number of works connected with the British sculptor Henry Moore. And um, Henry Moore was one of these artists who, in the 1950s, 60s, was kind of everywhere in the world. I anywhere you went in the world, you'd find a big bronze, you know, in a public square. Um, he was really knocking them out. Um, and he went to Mexico um, in the early 50s. Um, and he went to Diego Rivera's studio. And he saw these amazing papier-mâché uh, skeletons hanging in Rivera's studio. They're actually still there today. And he made some kind of quick sketches of these, these figures. And he later that day, he met um, Goeritz, who was working on this new experimental art center, El Echo, and a kind of interdisciplinary um, art center. Um, and he saw Henry Moore's skeletal figures, and he thought, why don't we make a, a mural for El Echo with these things? And that's what they did. They made this huge 11-meter-long, um, 7-meter-high mural in one of the spaces. And then they invited this young dancer who was 15 at the time, Pilar Pellissier, to come and, and dance in front of these kind of giant skeletons. And um, uh, I, I discovered that um, Pilar was uh, alive and well and a rather successful actress and um, working in stage and TV in Mexico City. And um, she agreed to um, come back and sort of revisit these, this sort of, it, to say that it was a performance wasn't really true because there was no audience. It was about, in a way, it was about generating images to promote El Echo as this interdisciplinary space where visual art and architecture and dance and music would kind of come together. So she never performed to anybody, and there was no real choreography. But because of that, it, it, there seemed to be this really interesting space to explore with, with Pilar, you know, um, so many years later on. Um, and so we, we made a, 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 a film, um, which I'm going to show you, or I'm going to show you the first few minutes of the film, just to give you a sense, which is... Um, kind of cuts between these promotional images of, of El Echo and, and the, the moment of, of Pilar trying to find her way back into that sort of 15-year-old self with her 76-year-old, 78-year-old body. Um, so, yeah, I'll just play you a little bit of that.
that's yeah, that's the first kind of third of, of, of the film. So again, you know, like much of the work that I've been talking about, it's it's this sort of about this relationship between um, between oh no. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so it's it's it, again it's about this relationship between still still images and and moving images. Um, and uh, again, it was you know it was shot on a thirty five millimeter film camera with the the camera constantly turned on its side. Um, and it, because so many of the images from that that um, the, from the 1950s were, were were vertical images, and the building is also very sort of vertical, um, as you could probably see. Um, so we're 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 really close to the end now. We're doing well. Um, uh, the, this is um, this is a work um, that's just it's it's actually still. On in, I'm just going to talk briefly about two things that kind of happened during the the pandemic and and had to become different things because of the pandemic because I wasn't able to travel in the way that I normally would etc cetera, etc cetera. and and um, they're also they're they're also in a way I was forced to deal with this notion of representation in in it because of the situation that the exhibitions were made under. Um, this first one is, is a, 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 a work that was made for a, an outdoor sort of sculpture project in a very remote little peninsula called the Okunoto Peninsula in the north of Japan. Um, a very beautiful place, um, a little bit sort of forgotten, but trying to sort of reinvent itself um, and using contemporary art, I guess, to do that. Um, and it's a work that I was originally going to make in Japan, um, but the pandemic arrived and I had to sort of completely rethink um, the work in a way. And, and I think it probably became something more interesting because of that, actually. Um, and it's the work that you're looking at is a series of um, six, um, glass, sort of laminated glass panels that were supported by rusty railway track. Um, and they show frames from a film. And the film was originally going to ma be made on this abandoned railway line in um, Okunoto. But um, as I say, it couldn't happen there. So I had to sort of rethink things a little bit, and I, I discovered an old uh, abandoned railway line outside um, Berlin, um, in a forest outside Berlin. It's a railway line that used to connect the city to actually the cemeteries outside Berlin. Um, and um, that became the, the sort of... Um, the, the set, as it were, for a short film, um, which I'll show you. Um, the film was actually shown in the tiny little station. It was projected in there. It was, you know, it was probably one of the smallest cinemas um, with seats for about three people, a little waiting room on this abandoned railway line that used to connect the, the peninsula to the the main island in a way. And that was closed about 20 years ago um, as, the, uh, as was the case in, in much of Japan, the kind of countryside started to kind of empty out and, and people moved to the big cities and um, the, the railway line um, closed. So um, I, I'll just show you a little bit of that film. Um, and... Uh, 
It's a, it's a film, um, it's, it's extremely, it's sort of extremely simple as a, as, a, as a film. It was made on a single roll of film. So all the edits were done in the camera. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's basically 400 feet of 35 millimeter black and white film. And um, it documents two sort of performers measuring 400 feet of railway track in the forest in, outside Berlin with a extruded silver bar. So the, the, the silver bar, which is five kilos of silver, was stretched until it was 400 feet long, like the, like the piece of film. So it has this very simple kind of um, structure. Um, and then, of course, was presented on 400 feet of railway track in, in Japan, a kind of overlay, a bit like, you know, the, um, the Pier Art Center and the Tate St. Ives being collapsed one onto the other, I guess. Um, so I'll just show a little bit of that and then we're very nearly done. Thank you. 
Now we really are at the end. Um, it, the, this, is another, this is another sort of show that was um, made sort of th throughout the pandemic. Um, it, wasn't, it was delayed um, about a year and a half in the end, I guess, because of that. It finally opened um, in the summer in, in Berlin at the gallery that I work with called Neugrimschneider um, and the, the, the exhibition was called The Pencil of Menzel and the Path on the Wolf and I'm not going to say anything about it because I'm actually just going to show you a very short film. It, it, it's kind of a, I suppose the reason I'm ending with this is it's kind of, um, it's actually something we were talking a little bit about at dinner, this idea of how, how do you, how do you work as an exhibition maker during a pandemic where there's you know limited access to exhibitions and people can't travel and of course one of the things that galleries a lot of galleries started to do was to think about making films uh, you know to, for have to distribute online of of their exhibitions and I, I was a little skeptical about that idea in the beginning but I actually think it was quite an interesting process and um, I'm gonna th there's a couple of the of more sort of installation views of the uh, e exhibition um, and but I'm gonna just finish the talk we can, if you, if you want to stay and ask questions afterwards that's totally fine if you want to skedaddle that's also I can understand that um, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna show you the um, it's got a weird edit at the beginning, I don't know where this came from, but um, I'm going to show you uh, this short film that was made in a way to sort of try and communicate the exhibition to people. Um, and I don't know, it's sort of, I think it was, for me, it was a very interesting experience. And it was, I, in some sense, I had a feeling that the, the film had a bigger impact in the world than the exhibition did itself, which is a strange thing after working on something for two and a half years. But um, it, there, there was there's something that there that I'm I, I think needs to be kind of I don't know explored or something in relation to to the work and and it very much relates to you know the work I showed at the beginning, the talk, um, and all of the things that have been kind of floating around in this kind of. Um, this meandering journey through my practice. So this is, this is um, the little film. We enter the pencil of Menzel and the path on the wolf from what feels like backstage, a fitting start perhaps for an exhibition which is in part, as its title suggests, about the making of images from the most rudimentary pencil to the high-tech digital path applied to cut out an image in Photoshop. What we discover on navigating around this wooden structure, this apparent partition held above the floor on scaffolding poles, is a hugely enlarged facsimile of a once tiny painting, Adolf Menzel's Berlin Tenements in the Snow from 1847. Magnified in every detail, every painterly lump and bump enlarged, every woodworm hole in its now flamboyant frame ten times its original size. This reproduction of Menzel's modest oil sketch can also be seen across the space in a photograph that hangs from two steel cables. Just one of the many echoes and scale shifts that reverberate across the exhibition from work to work. This image was made at Ritterstrasse 43, where Menzel painted the original in 1847.
the view from his bedroom window, now radically altered by 20th century apartment building and city planning. Both space and time are conflated and confused in this photographic return to source. The huge sculptural facsimile being returned in this modest print to its original size. Behind this suspended image of a suspended image is a one-to-one -one scale wallpaper image of the original Berlin Tenements painting alongside three other oil sketches by Menzel, the Anhalter railway station by Moonlight, head of a dead white horse, and portrait of Frau Merker. From here, more echoes, more connections start to ripple around the space. The black and white wallpaper image of the Berlin railway station painting are echoed not once but twice in two other 3D facsimiles on an adjacent wall. The original painting's colour has been removed and the resulting black and white image inverted as if viewed through a 19th century plate camera. These precise reproductions are a fusion of 21st century machine making and 19th century hand making. Cyborg paintings, you might say. Close to these two cyborg facsimiles is a mirror like sheet of silver plated copper, which, as well as reflecting the space and works around it, also holds a phantom image on its surface at one moment negative, but at the next, as you move around it, positive. The image is an elevated view from my own fourth floor studio and was made with the daguerreotype process, one of the earliest forms of photographic image making developed in Adolf Menzel's youth. Another painting made at Menzel's Ritterstrasse apartment the artist's bedroom appears in the form of a 75 to 1 scale reproduction of an installation view of a salon hang of Menzel's work reproduced in a catalogue. On closer inspection we realise that each printer's halftone dot has been substituted for a carefully selected black pushpin. 32,000 of these variously sized pins now make up this laboriously reconstructed image, labour that is seemingly negated in the tiny photographic reproduction of the pinboard painting that faces it on the wall opposite, once again returned to its original size. The echoes continue elsewhere, as Menzel's image vocabulary is reiterated in the contemporary moment. His celebrated studies of horses' heads find their near double in the form of similarly severed heads fed to the polar bears at a contemporary zoo, nature and culture oddly confused. Close by, a wolf, another contemporary character, once again common around Berlin, as they were in Menzel's lifetime, stalks another studio. The door is ajar. Is the wolf coming or going? We're not quite sure. In a small antechamber to the main exhibition, we find an oddly distorted architectural model, another daguerreotype and a large installation view of two more of Menzel's celebrated private paintings. One a view from another of his Berlin apartments at Zimmerstrasse. This somewhat abject urban scene has, with the help of the specifically constructed model built for the camera and some contemporary image stitching technology, been reenacted in another daguerreotype which now reflects Menzel's original in the photograph opposite in its mirror-like surface. The wolf we met earlier is seen lurking, ghost-like, in Menzel's back courtyard. Close by, another of Menzel's paintings, 
horse study from 1848 is seen hanging on a cracked grey museum wall. A fly sits close by as if attracted by the painting subject. Again, a confusion of nature and culture, perhaps. Next to this is a second pinboard, a fragment of the studio transplanted to the gallery. This mind map for the pencil of Menzel and the path on the wolf, a real backstage view of the development of the work for the exhibition includes process images from the making of the facsimiles and photographs, working drawings, archival material and the beginnings of the system for producing the pinboard painting. The largest image on the pinboard, a composited photograph somewhere between a still and moving image, tracks the printing of the large facsimile that began the exhibition. I'm really, I'm really sorry for the very jumpy video. I don't know, it's something to do with PowerPoint and video and it, it doesn't really go well. Um, but yeah, thank you for bearing with me.